Good evening, respected dignitaries and delegates. I, Dr. Siddharth Rao, Senior Resident, Department of Hospital Administration, Ames, welcome you to this final section of this first day of the conclave. This session is titled Legal, Ethical and Administrative Challenges in Emergency Care and Road Safety. It is said that every four minutes a life is lost due to road accidents in India. Last year, around 1.5 lakh people lost their lives due to road accidents in our country. Poor speed selection by motorists has been identified as the single major cause which contributes to this problem worldwide. Statistics show that the maximum number of road accidents occurred in the state of Tamil Nadu in India. Uttar Pradesh tops the list with the maximum fatalities due to drunken driving and overspeeding. The problem has reached such proportions that it has been estimated that the Indian economy takes a 3% hit every year due to road traffic accidents. In the recently concluded fourth edition of the Global Road Safety Week campaign, which concluded on 14th May of this month, the WHO Director General emphasized that speed is at the core of the global traffic injury problem and has, she has set a target of 50% reduction in deaths and injuries by 2020. To shed more light on this topic as well as other rela related issues, may I now invite to the dais Dr. Professor Suresh S. David, Medical Director, Pushbarigiri Medical College, Hospital Kerala, onto the dais. Sir. May I now invite Dr. A.K. Ahangar, Director uh, Shere Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences, Srinagar, and ex-officio secretary to government of Jammu Kashmir onto the dais. I now invite Dr. Mohammad Tariq Ali, Director, Institute of Critical Care and Anesthesiology, Medanta Medicity, Gurgaon, onto the dais. I now invite Dr. Tamarish Kole, Head of Department, Accident and Emergency Services, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket, Delhi, onto the dais. <laughs> Sri Deepak Parthak, Joint Commissioner of Police Headquarters, New Delhi, could not join us as he is currently occupied. May I now invite Dr. S.K. Bhoi, Professor of Emergency Medicine, Jay Prakash Narayan, Apex Trauma Center, Ames, New Delhi, onto the dais. I now invite Mr. Saji Cherian, Director of Operations, Save Life Foundation, onto the dais. Mr. Saji Cherian. I think he's not available. I invite Dr. Angel Rajan Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Hospital Administration, Ames, New Delhi, onto the dais. Thank you, respected dignitaries. May I now request Dr. Angel Rajan Singh to uh, moderate this session. A very good evening. Uh, we are here for a very important session on uh, legal ethical issues in the emergency and uh, trauma care and road safety. Uh, to begin the session, I'll uh, first request the session chairperson, uh, Professor Suresh David, to deliver his brief keynote and uh, subsequently we will start with the uh, views of the other panelists. Uh, Dr. David, please. A brief introduction of, about uh, Dr. Suresh Cherian. So one second. Suresh David. Dr. Suresh Samuel David is an Indian physician specializing in emergency medicine and is a medical director of Pushpagiri Medical College, Thiruvalla, Kerala. 
He is the first Indian physician to be formally trained in emergency medicine. Dr. David pioneered the practice of emergency medicine in India, and he is credited with founding the Department of Emergency Medicine at CMC Velour. He is the first person to hold the position of a professor in emergency medicine in India. Dr. David has published three medical books on emergency medicine, and two of them are the first handbook and textbook on emergency medicine authored by an Indian. He is a fellow of Royal College of Physicians London and the Australasian College of Emergency Medicine. He is also the recipient of the Best Doctor Award from MGR Medical University, Tamil Nadu, and he has received a citation from the former President of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. Dr. Suresh David, sir. Thank you and uh, good evening. Being the last keynote speaker, I'm very glad that Dr. Angel Singh said a brief keynote because that's precisely my intention. Because I do have the undue advantage that over the last so many hours, I've had the pleasure to savor the flavor of this conference. And based on my views that I've gathered, I have completely reorganized my slides. So I'm going to do less of talking, and I'm going to have my team to do most of the talking. Uh, to begin with, um, would you know what this animal is? Because I feel like this animal. <laughs> this is called a meerkat, a meerkat, and it lives in the arid uh, regions uh, across the globe as different species. And I feel like this because Dr. Gupta has given me a task like carrying so many babies at the same time because he wants me to speak on the legal, the ethical, the administrative challenges of emergency care and road safety, which makes five babies. So <laughs> it is indeed a challenge for me. So what we intend to do is we are dropping off a few things along the way because some of the babies are not really worth carrying. So we have decided to drop a few of the babies and my job is to basically highlight a few issues which hopefully will give the cue for my team members to take over. So I bring you greetings from Pushpagiri Medical College Hospital where I work. This is a 1,200 bedded medical college uh, hospital in Kerala. And uh, yes, I am primarily an emergency physician. I work in the emergency department. And to begin with, I just want to talk about the difference between the casualty and the emergency medicine department. Because in most hospitals across the country, we still have the casualty. There's a lot of difference. Casualty is the obsolete term, which actually should be relegated to the museums and put inside a bottle containing formalin, because it was something which came about during the World War I, where the casualties in a war were brought to a particular room. That was called the casualty room. The room still remains because America likes to hold on to it, and they call it the emergency room. But the rest of the world has changed on to ED, which is emergency department, because that was the place where casualty metamorphosed into emergency medicine, a distinct specialty which has the privilege of being the youngest specialty in India, because it came into notice by the medical, although the Medical Council of India knew about it in 1997, because I gave the proposal in 1997, but in 2009, yes, that's when they recognized the specialty, and in 2010 was when they started the recognition or the go-ahead for the MD in emergency medicine. But the fact remains that most of our, of our medical colleges across the country still have casualties. And the irony is when my, and the MCI comes for inspection, they want to know Oh, this is the emergency medicine department. Good. Now, where is your casualty? Um, I've been asked this question, okay? So, and I got rejected because I didn't have a casualty and I tried explaining, but I failed. So, the first thing that I want to let people know is that they are one and the same, that this is just the uh, evolved word for casualty. So if anybody wants to make any changes in your system, the first thing you need to do is to basically change all the names of casualty, remove them, and put emergency department in your respective institutions. Now, the fact remains, right across the world, right across the country, it's the world actually, and the, uh, as well as our country, when we look at the corporate hospital and the private sector, more and more admissions are coming through the emergency department. 
When I first started in Pushpagiri, this was three and a half years ago, we had about 60 to 70 patients, but today I, I see 150 patients per day. And the reason for that is that there is better access because it's very convenient, it's available all the time, and we do have barriers for specialist availability, especially during holidays, especially during evenings when they're not available. And the fact remains, and this has come to roost, and the fact is that the confidence of the community is growing day by day when it comes to emergency services that are available in most of the private hospitals today. Now, to begin with, one needs to understand that when we look at ethical, legal, uh, administrative challenges, there is a distinct difference between the care and the challenges of the elective medical care against that of emergency care. Lots of differences, I will not go through it. If you manage to read them, well and good. What you need to know is yes, there are a lot of differences. And there are lots and lots of differences. And we can have a half a day symposium on this alone. So the challenges which are faced by the emergency department are also multiple. To begin with, everybody who comes to the emergency department feels that his or her problem or his loved one's problem is an absolute emergency. It may be, it may not be according to you, but according to them, it is an absolute emergency. It needs to be seen now, and if it doesn't, my temper will flare. So we are dealing with a group of people who come to us with very, very short tempers, and yes, some of the patients are very sick, and some of them tend to die. And when they die, one of the expected human responses to grief is anger. So we have a group of people who potentially have a large predisposition to be angry. And the anger is usually thrown at the first person who is right there. And it's not surprising that we have so much of violence in emergency departments. Because we are dealing with demanding relatives, we also have patients who actually land up in the emergency and they don't want care. They don't want admission. And the relatives sometimes demand more than what we can do. So multiple other such problems therefore results in quite a lot of conflicts which occur in the emergency department. But hey, I don't want to know about your problems. It's like somebody said, don't tell me about your labor pains, show me the baby. Labor pains are your problem, it's not mine. So therefore, the fact remains that fundamental, when you look at the pyramid of development, the foundation for that which everybody expects is that there has to be timely and appropriate care. Timely and appropriate. So therefore, we are now dealing with three things, basically legal, administrative, and ethical issues. They are related, they are interrelated, they are connected. And there are certain ethical premises which we talked about today. We talked about justice, we talked about beneficence, we talked about autonomy. Yes, these three things are connected also. And yeah, like the compass, very similarly, as medical professionals, we do look at the law for guidance. Yes, we do. But the fact remains, and a question which we need to ask ourselves, is that can ethics substitute for law? In fact, it does in some, in some countries. And in very small countries where ethical way of living, ethical way of being is what is considered as the law. If you take, for example, Vatican City, which by itself is a country, everything goes by ethics. Laws are governed by ethics. But then the question is, can law substitute for ethics? Or is uh, are, are laws providing answers for all? No, it doesn't. Because statutes differ from country to country. Most of the literature that is available for us to, for you and me to look at, I'm not talking about keepers of the law, that is the lawyers who have books written for India by India. By and large, when you and I as medical professionals look at the internet for our literature, we find that most of the stuff that is available is from overseas. And many of those are not applicable to us. And quite often, the law does not reflect ethical behavior. For example, there is this, the, these two terms which we come across. One is professional secrecy, and the other is privileged communication. If we go by the Hippocratic way of thinking, yes, we are not supposed to divulge anything about the confidential information of a patient to anyone else. But then the law comes in and says, no, certain times you need to go above that. The law is above everything else. So therefore, privileged communication is the privilege given to the law for investigation 
of something which has been hidden. So therefore the law cannot substitute for ethics and ethics cannot substitute for law. And there are dilemmas. For example, resuscitation. I'm sure you know, you know that there are problems with resuscitation. I'll talk about it a little later. There's something called as futile therapy. You know that there is a patient who's got end of care, end of life situation. And care is demanded for that patient which is far more than what that patient would have liked or desired if he or she could have spoken to you. Unfortunately, they may be in a situation where they cannot speak to you and the relatives sometimes demand futile care. So that's yet another problem that we face in the emergency department because a patient will come in, he's 97 years old, he's got a fracture neck of femur and he's got bilateral signal because they have kept him at home for four days. They bring him here, they bring him inside and we find that you know he's really, really sick. He is going to die. But then sometimes the relatives will say, stop, please don't tell us anything about his death because we have a wedding in the family two days from now. Keep him alive, whatever you do, even if he dies, keep him alive. Even if he dies, keep him alive. This is what one of the relatives told me. Futile therapy, this is one of my ethical challenges as an emergency physician that I face. Consent, we have a problem with consent. But then of course the law now is very clear. There is something called as a societal consent where if a patient cannot give the consent for a life-saving intervention because he is not compass mentis, he's unable to speak for himself, then the society gives you the consent to go ahead and do the life-saving intervention. Refusal of care, quite often patients do that. In the books, they talk about Jehovah's Witnesses who refuse blood. I've had the problem when I was in Australia, when I had a road traffic accident where a patient was really sick, he needed blood, but he said, no, I will not have blood. And he bled and died in front of my eyes. I am still haunted by those thoughts because of the patient refusing care. What do I do? Do I go against his wish? No, I can't. Because then I'm going against the law. And nobody goes against the law. We also have duty and confidentiality. We also have certain other problems. As an emergency physician, I have certain ethical obligations. First and foremost, I need to, res to respond regarding of, vit of victim's income and social position. Not a problem, I can do that. That's not at all a problem. I will do every patient is important for me. But if I have a mass casualty, if I have five patients coming in at the same time, if one of them is very, very sick and the other one happens to be the daughter of the CEO, whom do I care for first? So therefore, this is a problem as an ethical dilemma which we see in the emergency department. We have to set strategies for care of non-emergencies. Patient who does not really require emergency care, but he or she walks up and says, I demand that I get seen by the doctor so-and-so right now because I am so-and-so. So what do we do regarding that? That becomes a problem. Secondly, duty to provide care. Yes, it is my duty, it's my moral obligation. But how do I handle a difficult patient, a, a, a violent patient, a dangerous patient, a combative patient? Should I go ahead? Should I risk my life and go in? So this is one of the conflicts which goes on within me as an emergency physician. Quite often, law is blind. We heard that before, yes. We have resources and we have requirements. The law, and the, uh, uh, the, the law expects so many things to be done and the government expects so many things to be done. But there is a balance which needs to be struck between two things, be between resources and requirements. This is one of the major problems. In fact, I'm an advisor for the Tamil Nadu government, which has approached me to look into and revise the entire process of trauma care in the country across the, across the state. That's because they have put the cart before the horse. They have procured all the equipment, stocked all the emergency, all the trauma centers, but there has been no capacity building. In fact, my team is going to talk about it. There are certain administrative challenges. Yes, we need to augment our ED services, our emergency resources, and we need to do capacity building and service, and we have to improve the efficiency and productivity. So many things to talk about and so little time to do so. Yes, multiple things to talk about. Structural re redesigning of hospitals and emergency departments, computerization. To think about, this is a food for thought. Should we introduce physician assistants and nurse practitioners in the emergency department to expedite patient care? Because it is happening in outpatients across the, across the country. 
So should the government of India look at this possibility to assist emergency physicians to expedite patient care in emergency, in busy emergency departments? Multiple things are there. Let me just put this up because I was just shown that I have hardly 60 seconds left. Advanced directives, yes. Advanced directives is a term which we as emergency physicians need to know because it is something where a patient willingly gives directive well in advance. And there are two important things. One is do not resuscitate, and the other is called as living will. Do not resuscitate is something we are familiar with. DNR, we have heard about it. Yes, we have heard about it. But I want to talk about living will. The living will is actually a documented. It's a legal document which is prepared by the patient when he or she is compass mentis, which means he or she is able to think rationally and make decisions for himself or herself. And these are regarding the healthcare decisions which have to be followed in the event of incompetency of that particular person who's making the living will. Quite often this is what happens to many of our loved ones. They do not do this and at the end of it, it falls on the responsibility of the family to take decisions for them. And these advanced directives are especially to stop supporting life and to facilitate death in dignity. That's what it's all about. Sounds fantastic, because the physician has to respect the living will. Oh, it's beautiful. I wish this was easy, I wish this was possible, but, sorry, the bad news, not yet in India. No, living will, no, 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 no such thing. Our law is a bit slow to bring this into, into the system. So no, living will only remains in the books and gets followed in the West. We cannot do this here in the country because, ladies and gentlemen, do not resuscitate, does not possess legal sanctity in our country. So therefore, be very careful. Whenever you're doing any DNR, make sure everything is documented and not it's your own decision or initiative. So we, I want to just touch upon EMS, the real one, not the one that we have today right across the country, because all we have is scoop and run. They are just glorified taxis which just pick up and run across the, across the country, except in few places where there are trained paramedics. Otherwise, nothing much happens. Emergency care begins only after the patient reaches an emergency department. And this is a system which is followed in, the, in, in Europe, where the, where the patient doesn't go to the hospital, the, patient go, the, the hospital goes to the patient which means there are mobile ambulances or ambulances in which there are doctors and the required stuff. So right then and there, wherever these emergencies are occurring, the patient is given the care and they call it as treat and street. Off you go. You don't even come into the hospital system. Probably the government needs to look at it. The possibility of mobile clinics to go around rather than overcrowd our hospitals. Food for thought. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. So remember one thing, okay? This is very, very important. And this is something that I want to talk about, reality and concern. Cracks in the foundation of healthcare is first perceived in the emergency department. Cracks in the healthcare system is first perceived in the emergency department. Why? Because we never close doors. The, close, the, the doors of the emergency department are never closed. Yes, ED, yes, is the ultimate safety net. But please remember, it's already bulging and ready to burst. So it's not very long before EDs will burn themselves out unless we take steps and, ad and address the challenges which are both ethical, legal, and administrative in emergency medicine and in emergency departments. So therefore, I stop now, and I'm going to let my team take over. They have questions which have come either through our own brainstorming or from the audience, which now Dr. Angel will take over and run it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Dr. David, for very lucidly setting the ball rolling. Um, you have touched on few very important issues related to emergency care. And uh, I think Dr. Ahangar would like to build upon the ethics in emergency care and uh, the domain related around that. So uh, we'll have Dr. Ahangar and his views on the ethics in emergency care. Thank you, Dr. Gupta and his team for inviting me to participate in this conclave. Well, so far as uh, emergency medicine and uh, road safety is concerned, 
I am the person who least knows about the subject. By default, I happen to be the administrator, but otherwise I am an open heart surgeon. Somehow, since uh, the topic has come up, I would touch it. We know that uh, out of the non-communicable diseases, one of the burdens is from the trauma. And road safety is of paramount importance. The latest figures suggest that about 6.2 million people die annually all over the world because of the road accidents. If we add the other trauma-related deaths, probably the figures will be proportionally very, very high. It's not the ethics that are involved here, but then the responsibility lies with the system that we have. The system includes the person who gives the basic care to the person at the reception, then the advanced life support, or the intensive care management. The responsibility does not stop there. It is the overall setup and the administration which need to take care of these ethical problems. Why don't these problems happen in the private sector? The reason is, please, I mean, it's not a malice against anybody. The reason is that the private sector takes only the selected stuff, and the government sector has no option but to take everything. I cannot see any ethics when I see a huge load of patients on trolleys, on floor, on ground, do not getting space. I have seen more or less about 200 patients every 24 hours in my institution, just waiting for primary care at the, uh, the, the, the reception in emergencies. Primary care in the sense, ensuring airway, ensuring circulation somehow or the other, or even oxygen facilities, which the system finds taxing at times. That's number one part. Number two is, unless we have advanced life support system adopted in all the tertiary care centers, and we have a very good infrastructure at the you know, peripheral health services, we probably cannot do justice with the ethics here and there. My source of concern would be not only in terms of the emergency and trauma management, but overall ethics. How do we address the ethics when we teach students? When, as a teacher, I put a student to every test, every problem, beyond what I teach him, I make him or her do my own personal jobs also, writing letters for me, posting them, writing literature for me. Where are those ethics involved? We need to have an introspection also ourselves. But, well, that's uh, something different. As an administrator, I would be in the forefront to make sure that I provide a system which has all the infrastructure, which has all the facilities, which has all the equipment, and the manpower supporting it. As long as it is not there, I do not find any scope for the ethics to get you know, involved in, 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 coming the, in coming for the management of a particular person. However, when we talk of the ethics, a person, be it a doctor, be it a nurse, be it an intensivist, when he or she is put to the accountability because of a fault somewhere, because of a negligence somewhere, which may not be deliberate, and how often does it happen deliberately? No. It doesn't happen deliberately. Nobody will do it with intention. As long as we have Hippocratic oath with us, no doctor on the earth can think of committing a blunder or mistake or a negligence. It is the system that he or she gets trapped into and faces the consequences. And at that point of time, it is neither the law, nor, nor the lawmaker, nor the law enforcing agency that comes to his rescue. How often have we seen our parliamentarians, the so-called lawmakers, following the law in the parliament itself, the highest temple. We have seen it. And when it comes to a doctor or a system or a medica Medicare, yes, everybody puts a rider there. They have not delivered the care. They have committed negligence. They need to be penalized. But who is at fault? As long as supporting a system is concerned, be it finances, be it administrative support, 
be it the legal support. All the institutions have their legal advisors with them. But how often do those legal advisors sustain or support the system? Very rarely. So my point of concern is, I was just noting down things from uh, your Good speech, days. as you said right now. I mean, we have a society that's its own, own responsibility. When a patient approaches doctor for treatment, at that point of time, the patient and the attendants or the friends or the near and dear ones are in a different attitude altogether. That time, the doctor is that God. But when there is a little bit of, not negligence but by design, but by default, that time, the doctor is not the God or semi-God, but he is something different. Where does the teacher's role for mentoring the student come? How often do we have mentoring in our institutions? Not frequently, very infrequently. And then the doctor himself. These things happen very, very rarely. It is not a matter of routine. It happens very, very rare. These are rarest of the rare cases, as the law says. The society that we face, that becomes hostile all of a sudden when there's a bit of, say, a negligence, I repeat, by default, that time the things change entirely differently. The reason is, I'll quote, a teacher asks a student, your friend needs 500 rupees, how much will you give him? He says, all the more 500 rupees. The teacher says, no, he doesn't need 500, he needs only 400. How much will he return to you? Student says, zero. Teacher tells the student, you're wrong, you're a fool. Student replies, sir, you don't know my friends. That's where I end. You don't know our society, you don't know our teachers, you don't know our supportive system, lawmakers, law holders, very, and Very the beautifully summarized, sir. Uh, as far as the society and the considerations are concerned, I think uh, Mr. Cherian from the Save Life Foundation has done a lot of, lot of uh, social work and a social movement uh, which has impacted a large population of the society. And uh, we can have his views on road safety and the work the Save Life Foundation has done in that direction and the success they have achieved uh, in that movement. Dr. Cherian. Good evening, everybody. Um, I am not a medical professional, uh, so I am really honored uh, to be present in the midst of uh, such uh, wonderful uh, doctors and senior doctors. Um, Save Life Foundation is a nonprofit um, which works specifically on the issue of road safety and emergency care. Uh, we don't have a single doctor in our team. Um, what we recognized. Uh, is that India loses almost 400 uh, people every day in road, road crashes. We don't call it accidents, uh, we call it crash. Uh, so each and every uh, crash that happens uh, is preventable. So people are dying of uh, preventable injuries. Uh, we started off the organization uh, because of uh, a crash that happened and the founder lost his nephew because uh, he bled to death on the road. Uh, a young school going kid uh, was hit by a vehicle and uh, 45 minutes he lay on the road and uh, not a single person called for help uh, or for the responders. We looked at this aspect and, and, and tried to figure out why, why are people dying on the roads? What's the primary reason? And what we figured out is there is a major gap um, in, in the system. In fact, there is no system in place. Uh, when a crash happens, typically what we call as a chain of survival for the victim starts. The first link in that chain is bystander care, which, uh, which is very <coughs> crucial. In India, uh, the general uh, thought process is that we Indians are apathetic, which is absolutely wrong. Indians are not apathetic. So when there is a train uh, crash that happens, or a building collapse, or even a bomb blast. We see people actually uh, rushing in and helping out uh, the victims. 
But when it comes to road crashes and when it comes to victims of violence, for example, in the case of Nirbhaya, we see people hesitate. Uh, we found out through a national survey that people do not help road crash victims because of three primary reasons. One is police harassment, which happens. Second is detention at the hospital. And third is the long judicial process that they get sucked into. In the West, in the developed nations, even when they have the best emergency response system, like 911, they have what we call as the Good Samaritan laws, where they motivate, encourage, and protect people to come ahead and help and call uh, emergency response. Uh, in India, we don't have that. And so we took up this whole issue and say, OK, let's first fix this link, first link in the chain of survival. And that's how the whole Good Samaritan movement started. So because of our petition, Last year, the Supreme Court came out uh, with a judgment on March 30th, 2016, providing for Good Samaritan protection for every citizen in this country. So basically, when any citizen calls the ambulance or calls for the police, uh, he can remain anonymous. He need not even uh, share his name or his address. Even when he goes to the hospital, uh, the doctors are not supposed to take down that person's name. There is uh, no compulsion to write his name on the MLC form. So. What I and what our organization uh, believes is that we don't have an emergency response system in India as of now. Look at the capital city. We work with the Delhi police very closely. In fact, Mr. Pathak, if he would have been here, the PCR vans in, in, in Delhi unofficially is probably Asia's largest ambulance service. Every year, close to 50,000 victims they take to the hospital. That's not the job of a police van. The job of a police van is to provide law and order and take care of that. But unfortunately, in the capital city of India, we don't even have a proper ambulance service. The fact that doctors get attacked in the hospitals is because the patient is not getting any intervention on the way. He reaches the trauma uh, care, uh, trauma, uh, the, the emergency medicine department in a very bad shape because he doesn't get any, any help. So, so I, think, I, think I think we can have Dr. Tarek uh, give his views on the ambulance uh, uh, and the pre-hospital care uh, as far as EMS is concerned while we are discussing this topic. So I'll request Dr. Tarek to please share his views on this. Road crashes. Beautiful town. Look, it was rightly pointed out that um, in our country, Uttar Pradesh, well, uh, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, we have the maximum number of casualties, right? And that is because, that is because not only of the structure of the roads, but the attitude of drivers and the general population as such, their tempers are high and their threshold is very, very low. Now, when you look at any ambulance arriving at a scene, well, do they just scoop the patient and run, as uh, you pointed out? Well, I think in the current circumstances of staffing and uh, uh, the qualification of our ambulance staff, I think that is uh, one of the best ways. We really need to look into that because there is a certain amount of delay in reaching the scene. That's the first thing. Second, if you don't scoop and run, by the time you return, the delay is double. So we really need to look at what is the, the right approach for the Indian scenario to choose between scoop and run versus stay and play. Uh, the other thing that I would uh, like to point out that uh, We are all taught about, all doctors are, at least, we are taught about uh, the BLS, that is the basic life support. Now, I think um, a move should be there, um, particularly from all the important people around here, that when we are taught about BLS, the first thing is the bystander response. The bystander is a common, a common person. If there is a crash, even in a university or, um, say, a factory where people are reasonably kind of educated, there is no bystander response. So my suggestion here would be that whether it is a government service 
or it is a private sector service upon upon employment of a particular individual when he is uh, called in for his medical checkup, they should also have some knowledge or some competence about, about the BLS. This is what I would suggest. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tariq. I think the chain of survival was a very beautiful term uh, given by Dr. Sharian. And to continue with this chain of survival, we will move on to the hospital-based uh, emergency care in which Dr. Bhoi uh, is an expert and we have Dr. Tamoresh also with us. So we would listen to both of them on the uh, legal, administrative and the ethical challenges related to the hospital-based emergency care, specifically um, with the term casualty which Dr. David discussed earlier and the emergency departments which are coming up now and we have more and more specialized emergency departments so-called trauma centers or heart command centers which are now cropping up and uh, i would uh, request dr boy uh, to start the discussion on this topic thank you angel and uh, thank you to the panel as well so the the term the term which uh, professor david said casualty actually the patient when lands up in the casualty becomes the victim of casualty medical officer across the country. You must be thinking it is a hard statement, but it's true. Just because we have not trained them, demean them all the time, oh my God, he's a CMO. That means derogatory remark. You are putting to your own colleagues, right from sneezing to arrest, from neonate to prostate, you will come to the ER and tell the, give a demeaning word to the CMO. But things have changed, but yes, we talk about uh, the casualties and manning in the across the country, it is similar situation across the length and breadth of country because yeah, emergency medicine is still in its infancy right now. In this decade, the good thing about this decade is the previous decades have been the decades of infectious disease and other communicable disease because that plagued us after independence and killed a lot of them. But now the, this decade is one way you can see a lot of refocus, a different focus on emergency care. And this is a good part. It is a good heartening to see that a lot of investment, of knowledge investment, as well as economic investment of building infrastructure right from the government, the Ministry of Health, Government of India, as well as many academic institutions and non-academic institutions putting their effort in this system, what is called an emergency care system. And if you see this decade, there a lot of focus has been in the, the trauma. So there was a, and there a lot of focus as well as a lot of, you know, push and lobbying for trauma centers, the concept across length and breadth of the country, because seeing this is an epidemic, it has gone to epidemic proportion, trauma is now an epidemic in the country. So you can see it is a mini tsunami which we are having almost every day, you know, that kind of people are dying. So it's a good part, but when we're putting a lot of effort on, you know, putting trauma centers across the country, you see we are doing it for only 10% of the cases, or 10 to 15% of the cases coming to the emergency room. If you see emergency room data, it is 10 to 15% of them, they are trauma. But our focus, if you see the U.S. experience, there have been various levels of trauma centers as per laid on by American College of Surgeons, the similar thing actually we try to copy them in our country. Level 1, level 2, level 3 and level 4 uh, trauma centers in the country. And we had the apex standalone trauma center from where I come. I work there as a professor of emergency medicine there. That is the apex standalone trauma center. It was conceptualized by our forefathers. And that is where we look at the benchmark. You can have in our country a benchmark institute like this, because our country is vast, so you can have benchmark centers from north, south, east and west as a regional apex centers. And the, that is called as this thing. But now what has happened is we have built standalone, you know, many units of trauma centers, level two, level three, across the golden quadrilateral, which are now not finding people to recruit, you know, and work in those centers. So, and you have to duplicate things, like getting resources, human resources as well as infrastructure resources as well as equipment. You have to have duplication of that from the existing facility. So this is the paradox of 
the, at, at this crossroad, this is a paradox. So the, the thinking is, what is my viewpoint, and I think this is my viewpoint, is even in the US, there is now amalgamation of the existing trauma centers to the, exist, the facility, which is already there. Suppose now, and this is the thinking also of the Ministry of Health right now also, there is a changing direction. The existing medical colleges will be the level one facility. And that is going to be, you have to just correct the deficiencies of the human resource. Suppose the neurosurgeon is not there, you fill that up. And we know that all medical colleges will have the CT scans and everything because it is required for MCI recognition. You know that MCI is too hard. Even a single instrument is not that you will de recognize. So that is a plus point. So you make them as a level one trauma center, existing facility, and level two. And we are trying to fill that up. Angel is also with same in the same committee. So we are looking at that, that issue. The other aspect is emergency medicine, in which caters to almost 90% of the non-trauma emergencies. So my viewpoint is you should have emergency care system rather than have standalone trauma centers, where you will not find people to work. In the existing facility, have a emergency room which caters to trauma. Yes, there is a lot of focus on trauma by government of India. You can, with the same money, same economy investment, you can build a beautiful system which takes care of the trauma. Yes, that is taken care of, but it benefits 90 other 90 percent of other patients, including mass casualty and disasters. So that is. There is a take I would yeah. like to give. And uh, I think we will uh, carry on that with Dr. Tamora. She has been building the concept of emergency medicine in max hospitals for almost a decade and has very recently shifted to VPS Healthcare uh, with the aim of building the entire emergency medicine department and the system over there. So we could have Dr. Tamorish talk about the challenges of building an emergency system and also the manpower and staffing issues in that before we open the floor to the house for questions. I think, um, thank you all the panelists. Uh, almost every point is touched and uh, <clears throat> I echo all your views in similar manner. Now I come from the other side of healthcare, the private healthcare, uh, and we face similar challenges. And if you take these three pillars of challenges, legal, ethical, administrative, I think fundamental problem with uh, private healthcare is administrative. Because when a patient walks into a private healthcare, you know, of any sort, the expectation is much higher. And with that, and now it, you know, in the age of uh, internet when everybody is connected, we have seen people have understood the concept of emergency care, what is expected uh, at the time when they need it. Now the primary challenge here is that how far do you go in the emergency care? You know, Supreme Court says that you should stabilize a patient and transfer to a nearest facility if you can't. Now, medically we know there are some, you know, sick patients who will never, cannot be stabilized without definitive treatment. Now there is no guideline for that. And this is just one small problem, there are many other problems. Uh, so we need to redefine uh, what Dr. Goy has just told, the emergency care systems on this light of new expectation and new development in our country. Now we are not the only country who are going through these changes. Every other similar developing country is going through this developmental milestone uh, in the issue of emergency care. And we need to wait patiently and find innovative solutions within our existing resources and try to understand that everything cannot be fixed in one day. And we, what we should not do is repeat the mistakes of the developed countries who has gone through the similar changes and uh, do it. For example, the issue of standalone trauma center. We should have been realized it before and start developing you know, an amalgamated system. Similarly, whenever we build an you know, emergency care system for mostly say urban setup, we need to involve both sides, public and private. And how to deal with, you know, challenges of continuity of care and all that. Otherwise, if, you know, the patients who are referred for many reasons to, say, trauma center will be overcrowded and they will not be able to take care of the patients which really needed care. So this anti-dumping mechanism has to come in place very strongly 
through legal framework. There is anti-dumping law in US. We can study that and come with a very strong anti-dumping law so that the emergency care is provided at least the basic standard which is expected out of any healthcare institution. And therefore, a major detailed definition of legal framework, administrative framework, and ethical framework has to be in place. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tamurish. I think we can open the house for questions now. Uh, please, uh, you could raise your hands and we could uh, ask questions one by one. Uh, could someone give the microphone there? It's not a question, it's a small submission. In the armed forces, uh, we don't everywhere have the medical staff, medical assistants or the nursing assistants. So we have a concept of the battlefield nursing assistants, the body care. As Dr. Tariq said, uh, I am on deportation to the Indian Coast Guard quarters in Bombay. So what we did in Navy in Cochin also, we made a card like this for the a basic life support care, till airway, breathing and compression. Now, one of the man one of the work mandates of the Coast Guard also is a community, uh, a community participation outreach program. We do it for the fishermen at sea. So we have made it into Marathi language also, and it's our endeavor to teach the people in the basic life support. Not everywhere you will get the medical staff. That is my only submission, and so that we can make it compulsory. Why not in the private organizations also? This side, please. Left. Hello. Sir, I am having a one company by name IES Medicare. And uh, I have developed a, a website on that uh, a person can register their blood group, like uh, blood group, then country, state, and districts. And person can search also like uh, blood group and then country and state wise. So I want uh, question, sir. How can I promote this in this uh, industry? So could you just sub support us? Uh, any of the panelists who would like to address the question? Online blood bank, na? Yeah. Yeah, sir. <laughs> this is a very good concept which you have developed. You know, and I think you should uh, contact the uh, national. You know, there is a. NACO. NACO. The National AIDS Control Organization controls the blood banking in the country, sir. Yeah. They would be the ideal uh, organization to connect because they are the regulatory yeah. framework for this uh, thing. We'll have the next question. No, I have one more suggestion for you. I mean, since what you're doing is something very, very relevant, because one of our major deficiencies yeah. right across the country is the uh, non-availability of blood when it's required, not just for trauma, but for all emergency care or wherever there is exsanguination, either in the theatres or on the road, wherever it may be. So my other suggestion, in addition to being affiliated with NACO, is also um, if you have uh, developed a net, I don't know whether you're based only in Delhi or across. The, okay, then the best thing is also to make your presence known to the various institutions. Because quite often at times they may need blood, and if there is some kind of a 24-hour hotline, which you have with the institutions, Yeah, but more than that, I think it is useful for you to get in touch with the various institutions and let them know that you have, you, you can lend a hand if required. So, so then I'm, I'm sure they will utilize that. This is exactly the point which also impacts a lot of emergency services, including ambulance availability in our country, that we often have resources, but people are not aware that the resources are there. Uh, in fact, uh, under the chairmanship of Dr. Shakti Gupta, we had a committee which looked into it. And uh, it was found that on national highways, you could have a spot where there would be ambulances from the National Highway Authority of India, from the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, and from the toll operator who is handling. But all three ambulances would be operated under different numbers, and the public would be uh, not aware of any of those three numbers. So all three of them are standing idle, and they are uh, not being used. That is because of lack of awareness. So the way you are doing a fantastic job, to make people aware is going to be one of the bigger challenges, if I'm not wrong, what sir is saying. Sure. <coughs> Great work, sir. Great work. Please. Yeah. You can come and meet me in the AIMS Trauma Center. I am Dr. Cheran, Dr. Kamadwite. I have three messages. One, Professor David was mentioning about this living will. 
living will has already been approved six months back by courts of India. A person who is not terminally ill can make a living will by which at the final stages, if he does not prefer any treatment, he can be let alone. That is approved by court, first thing. Second thing, DNS is not approved in India is also a old message. Because DNS was considered equivalent to a suicide and then it was not allowed. Now, from April 2017, suicide is no more a crime. We need not put MLC for suicide anymore. So, when suicide is no more a crime, DNS is also naturally allowed. And third message is, Sarah was telling about Supreme Court mandates that stabilizing the patient is must. No, only the clinical act, clinical establishment act says you have to stabilize the patient. Supreme Court mandates only the first aid to be given. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Your messages are well taken. Uh, Dr. Gupta would have a point. Uh, just I want to share that uh, we conducted one workshop somewhere in 1999 uh, to develop the modalities for providing comprehensive trauma care services, uh, services for the Delhi metropolis. And uh, what we had proposed at that, because you see that in present scenario that everybody starts coming with the trauma centers without any supporting other facilities. We propose that there should be a centralized trauma center, which can be called as an apex trauma center like AIMS has got. And there need to be satellite centers, where the, once the patient is, uh, these satellite centers to be attached to the larger hospitals nearby. And if there is an accident, or, and the patient immediately can be taken to the satellite center, where after resuscitation, stabilization, and first aid that can be referred to the nearest hospital which has been identified or designated hospital rather than uh, sending this patient directly to the trauma center which is already overburdened. And uh, what is missing at the, uh, we also propose that there should be a networking of the hospitals within that loop and with close coordination with the CATS ambulances, with the police ambulances, with the police, with army and with other sources actually so that actually they know their strength. So that one hospital does not know actually the strength in other hospitals, that uh, in terms of manpower, in terms of equipment, in terms of services or specialist services. So when we submitted this proposal to then actually Health Secretary, uh, Mr. B.P. Singh at that time, actually he said that this is an excellent proposal, so we have proposed about 200 crore piece at that time. They said that will increase to about 800 crore, we will definitely get through the World Bank. And uh, we again revised that actually and submitted to that actually. But uh, I'm happy that the Apex Center has come, but there is no satellite center still has to take it. So what I propose that if we go for the establishing this comprehensive trauma care services, whether in metro or other large cities, if we don't work like, uh, if we start only making the trauma center, it will not serve the purpose. It has to be a total comprehensive system, which will take care about all the aspects. Because uh, if you take the example of uh, uh, President Ronald, uh, Ronald Reagan, when he was shot, he was taken to the Im immediate nearest facility, healthcare facility, and the intervention done with them immediately, and they survive, he survived. So here actually the total different concept actually. If there is accident ha happens in on the say in Delhi on the uh, Noida or uh, eastern side actually, immediately the patient will be referred to the uh, trauma center actually, and they lost precious time actually on way to the hospital where actually the ambulances yeah, you said that what are the ambulances are there there are transport ambulances so they don't provide actually uh, level of treatment which is required to the patient injured patient which he requires at that time actually and we lose 40 to 50 percent of patient on way i think when we are proposing we should propose a total comprehensive project rather than actually government uh, in a very haphazard man manner Politically, actually, give a trauma center to this state, to this state, but there is no supporting services. And I need comments from Dr. Suresh David. Mm, thank you so much, sir. And uh, yes, please, sir. That's right. <coughs> so I think the, the outcome will be better for any emergency and trauma case will be if we make, if we add five pillars, uh, especially for trauma, uh, five pillars of uh, road, uh, in a, sorry, uh, road traffic crash victims uh, treatment. The first is will be the especially work on the leadership. Second pillar is legislation, strengthening our existing legislations. Third is obviously, you know, funding. 
and fifth is the uh, sorry fourth is the uh, means is the capacity building and obviously at the policy level is one more pillar is the policy which you talked about that comprehensive policy on an integrated trauma care system which should i feel that we should be talking about an emergency care system which includes trauma rather than only talking about trauma system and leaving out 90% of the population who comes to the emergency room and i think that any if the government of india we have just now we had a discussion last week i think we had with uh, angel and you know with the, the joint secretary sir that we said that those institutions which are going to get funding through trauma project they have to have emergency medicine uh, uh, you know uh, program or emergency medicine or emergency department structured emergency medicine department in their hospital uh, as a mandatory thing then only they will going to get funding that is what uh, you know he said so so in this way i would like to add that we are slowly and slowly trying to push upon the concept of facility verification and designation in which instead of providing or naming the facilities or building facilities as trauma centers you have hospitals which are verified and designated according to the level of care they can provide and they are given a specific designation saying this is a level 1 facility or a level 2 facility but it actually handles all type of emergencies exactly. but its level of trauma care handling is defined yes, yes. so that is the concept and we are trying to on the ministry's level also <coughs> the concept is that we can try to upgrade their level of handling the trauma care instead of specifically building them as trauma centers and so, it will benefit the other cases also so the holistic uh, approach would uh, slowly start coming in and i think it's time we conclude the session so we can have very brief two to line closing remarks from all the panelists uh, we can start with dr cherin uh, if you have any closing remarks sir. well i think um, in the past couple of years i think road crash and the effects of road crashes have become mainstreamed in in india that's why we are talking a lot about road crashes and uh, road traffic injuries i think from the uh, from the medical community uh, what we believe is that there has to be a more stronger push uh, there has to be especially in the uh, in the legislation and policy making space i think there's a lot of work being done on the ground but uh, for example trauma registry that is something i mean if you don't have proper data how are you even going to design a trauma system so trauma registry is something that that can be pushed across it excellent sir this is something which is in fact one of the pillars of the uh, revised trauma program of the government of india also and there is a lot of focus on trauma registry and aims has already started a lot of work and in rml there is a centralized trauma registry which is now coming up but this is some feedback in which the support of organizations like yours would be very important dr tamorish any closing remarks if you would like i think most important uh, for us to understand that we have to take few steps at one time you know if you want everything at one go it will not happen it will take time so in my view i think it's it's high time that we sit down and uh, we, we do a kind of a workshop with all the stakeholders and uh, put up national milestones in emergency care so development system unless we put national milestone i think we will still discussing the same thing 5 years from now great sir thank you uh, dr tarik any closing remarks yeah uh, well this is about um, the ethical question um, about futility of treatment and end of life care it is as important in the emergency as it is in icu uh, my background is that of uh, critical care so i face that problem every day um just very quickly that the indian society of critical care medicine has published a position statement it was last year so that can be looked at and i would definitely like the um, my colleagues from the emergency department to liaise with the iccm so that we can have a combined kind of position statement that puts up um, into something like a legal safety zone that's the one thing um the other one is uh, futility of care only last month did we have something called as the mathura declaration which um, eminent figures from critical care signed up for laying down guidelines which are endorsed by law for end of life care and not have a 95 year old put on the ventilator just because the relatives want it and the last one is that uh, we still don't see many medical social workers input in the emergency area as it happens in the west um 
emergency uh, services are, I know, they're very different here, but the medical social workers do have a very good impact as far as communication is concerned when it's ICU care. So my suggestion would be have a look into the social worker part as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, any closing remarks? Dr. Anger? My suggestion would be making secondary level education at colleges and universities mandatory for basic life sport and uh, in fact extended to all the forces, police, security forces in general and in that direction involve non-governmental organizations as well as public-private partnership to make it as a sustainable model in the society in general and if possible extend to the entire society wherever it is applicable where it is possible so that we could not only minimize the number of deaths but we would be ready to face any challenges anytime excellent suggestion sir uh, dr boyd closing remarks my closing remarks will be that like we had national aids control uh, program in many control program national programs we have similarly we should have a national injury you know prevention program you know national injury control program something like that which has got a lot of impetus on injury prevention because that is then only we uh, will be able to decrease the mortality and morbidity associated it so that should be a big challenge and we should push it every way excellent uh, in the last i will request uh, dr david uh, before we conclude sir i have general pramar with some uh, important suggestion or question uh, to hear the the entire panel uh, whatever deliberation that they have had but the, to share with you that we have trained all the traffic police for 10,000, the taxi drivers 7,000 as a part of initiative in Bangalore to bring the BLS on these stores. And all the uh, Apollo Hospital, Banargatta, the entire uh, emergency medical department training is 100% success rate in all the examination because of the level of training that is imparted. And it's known that if there is a real emergency, that hospital is to be approached but my uh, the issue that I have worked very closely to support the EMR it requires a lot of support in the hospital if patient has reached then if a revascularization is to be done in golden hour though he may not come in golden hour but at the fastest in the stroke cases or whatever has to happen the entire system has to be reworked with a network um, accountability responsibility and the team should be available that having patient received in the EMR he should be able to be looked after, salvaged, survived, to give a best of honor that you need another support system in the entire hospital, whether blood bank, whether diagnostics and CT and MRI or cath lab and all that. It has to be integrated into one to deliver, to get the best out of the EMR services. So it should not be lost sight of, even you build the services, collateral department to support the EMR has to come the staff designated who responsibility who will be available. If it is done, then only the benefit of EMR will be arrived at. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll now request Dr. David, the chairperson of the session, to kindly give the closing remarks as to conclude the session. Thank you, Dr. Angel. I think it's been fantastic listening to all of you. And um, I'd like to finish with three points. And the first one is, I'd like to give special credit to the armed forces because you know I see that there are representatives here and uh, I have interacted with the armed forces um, all over the country as well as um, with INS Ashwini very recently. One of the things that I believe that we have to learn from the army is that they're echelons of care. And I don't understand why when we have such a fantastic system sitting right here, we have not really thought about it. You see, they have the field hospital, then they have the base hospital, then they have the command hospital, and then finally, that's when the patients land up in the r, &R where they are airlifted most often. So that's why they never get stressed, they never get you know, overburdened and overcrowded, because they've got a fantastic system. So that is something that we should look at, because that reflects what we've been hearing from Professor Boy. That's my second point, and that is the amalgamation 
of trauma care with emergency care. So you have basically an integrated emergency care system rather than look at just trauma care system development. So I only hope that uh, the government of India would look at it positively and invest in the right way where we don't put the cart before the horse, as I said. It has to be a three-pronged approach where you have to do capacity building as much as you are investing in terms of equipment. Because unless they go hand in hand, you quite often you find that there's equipment, but they're just rusting and rotting in the so-called trauma centers, which are not being used. So I I'm sure it will come through. And the third point, of course, that I want to talk about was that um, whatever we say and do, um, I only wish that it goes beyond what we have said so far because most of us are on the same page as you can see we are all talking about the same thing and you all agree with me but if there is some way by which I would uh, ask Dr. Gupta and his colleagues to make sure that whatever we are deliberating upon here is listened to and understood by the government so that we can take some positive steps because I'm sure Dr. Angel and Professor Boy are all involved in this but I think you and your team uh, which is you're all heavyweights and I'm sure you'll be able to push this through because I come from a small village out in Kerala. But one of the lessons that I want to leave behind, in addition to what we have heard so far, that's my third point, and that is having the community involvement. Because what we have spoken about is so far developing um, the personnel, developing the equipment and everything, but ultimately the recipients are the community. Because having worked in CMC by law for nearly 25 years, I mean, uh, I've been there for 40 years, and having moved to Kerala three years ago, I find that there's a stark difference between what I saw in Velour and what I see in Kerala. In, in Kerala, the, the, the accidents are very, very minimum. The trauma is very minimal. Why? It is because of the level of education, the level of awareness in the community about the dangers. And quite often it is our people. If you take, for example, the two um, places, which is Tamil Nadu and Uttar Pradesh. Tamil Nadu probably because it is being reported most. Like the first HIV case was reported in Tamil Nadu because, you know, the reporting system is better. But Uttar Pradesh, for example, has got the maximum fatality. That reflects on the awareness of the community. So therefore, the government should take some steps by which there is capacity building which starts from the grassroots level, which is the people whom we intend to serve. So that also can become my third point, and if these can be somehow pushed across to the government, I'm sure the time that we spend here is not a waste. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I wish to thank all the panelists, the chairperson, and all the audience for patiently hearing to us and asking your questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you to all panelists. Uh, may I now request uh, <coughs> Dr. David to felicitate our panelists. Uh, I request Dr. David to present a uh, moment token of appreciation to Dr. A.K. A.G. Ahangar, Director, Shere Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences. I now request Dr. David to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Muhammad Tariq Ali. <laughs> Dr. Tamoresh Kole. Dr. S. K. Bhoy. Mr. Saji Cherian. May I now request Professor Shakti Kumar Gupta to present a token of appreciation to
I now request Dr. Chandrasekhar sir to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Suresh S. David. May I request the panelists and chairperson to assemble for a guru photograph, so with the certificate. 